You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I'll interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm your host, Adam Sokol, and if this is your first time listening in, thanks so much for being here. If you've been here for a while now, thanks for coming back. Today's episode is with Hannah Witten, who is the young adult fantasy author of the new book, The Fox Glove King. This is the first book in a new series. You may recognize Hannah Witten's name because she wrote the wildly popular For the Wolf, uh, which was kind of a reimagining retelling of uh, Little Red Riding Hood, which I adored. And I loved The Foxglove King as well. It is <clears throat> the beginning of a epic fantasy series. And it's all about this young woman named Lore who has the ability to kind of deal with and handle uh, death more often. There's these drugs that connect people to death and make them feel like close to death without actually dying and all these different things going on. And it's just a very lush and incredible world that she's built out. And there is a heist involved and all sorts of great stuff going on. You're going to absolutely love the book. Our discussion today is another one about musical theater. I think one of the things I've discovered while doing this podcast is that a lot of people are just like me and they grew up loving musical theater. Uh, We specifically talk about her (laughs) attempts and ultimately failures to get into musical theater herself, as well as her lifelong love of various shows and the things that she's most excited to listen to. Uh, today. I think you're really, really going to love it. I had a joy with this conversation. Anytime anyone wants to talk musical theater, I am on board. Uh, Before we get to that, I want to give you a book recommendation and then let you know how you can get a hold of me. I just finished uh, Heart That Works by Rob Delaney. It's a very quick read. Rob Delaney is a comedian and a comedic writer and actor, perhaps best known for the show Catastrophe. Uh, His book is all about one of his young sons who unfortunately passed away from pediatric brain cancer when I believe he was three years old. So it's very heartbreaking, but I just love the way that Rob handles it in the sense that he openly talks about his emotions and it's not one of these books where he feels like he's at peace with it. And so he wrote this story. He's still very angry about it. And I think that's something that you know, any time anyone loses something important in their life, it can cause you to feel anger. And you always read these books where people say like, oh, I'm at peace or it's cathartic or, you know, I now understand that it's actually good for me. He, he's not doing that in this book. He's just basically saying like, I'm pissed off. This sucks. I hate this. Uh, but he's also just very open and honest about all the things that he misses. And it's a beautiful story. So highly, highly recommend it. You will probably cry, but it's it's a very quick book and it's very impactful. If you want to get a hold of me, you can always find me at passionsandprologues at gmail.com. There you can email me any ratings or reviews you leave of the show and I'll give you some customized book recommendations. You can also always send me your passions, the things that you're super passionate about. And once a month, I send out a random bookshop.org gift card to anyone who has done that. So thank you for everyone who's been doing that. I really, really love reading those. You can also find me on TikTok and Instagram at Passions and Prologues, where I do book recommendations all the time. So, okay, that's enough housekeeping. I am so excited for you guys to check out this discussion with Hannah Witten, author of the just released The Foxglove King on Passions and Prologues. Okay, Hannah, what is the thing you're super passionate about that we're going to be discussing today? I love musical theater. (laughs) Yes, yes. You said this right before we started recording and I literally said, stop, don't say anything else. I want it all to be like authentic. So um, let's, let's get into it. First things first, like when you say you love musical theater, do you mean like you love performing, you love watching, like give me your... All of it. Yeah. All of it. I, um, that was like my first thing whenever I was a kid. Um, and I was one of those kids that was privileged enough that my parents spent like a lot of time and money trying to find what my thing was. Like they Uh kept uh, putting me in like a bunch of different sports, which never really panned out. Um, 
tried me like on a bunch of different instruments and I just never found something that I really latched onto and was like, yes, this is it. This is what I want to do until I was in third grade. And I had always been like a really dramatic kid. Uh (laughs) My mom was like, I heard that they were doing auditions for Annie at like the community theater. Is that something you'd want to try? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So third grade me auditioned and I was almost Annie. I was like in the, um, like the smaller like audition group that they were making sing tomorrow and all that jazz. I didn't get any, but I was one of the orphans that like had speaking roles Mm -hmm. and a solo and stuff. So I thought that I was a hot shit. (laughs) And um, that just kind of started after that. I auditioned for literally everything that came down the pike like that was just the most fun experience and um, really I, I just latched onto it really hard. Uh-huh. So I did that I did um, theater from then until I was like 16. And the only reason that I stopped is because we moved away and the place that we moved to didn't really have like a theater mm-hmm. um, program. So yeah. I would, I would have kept doing it if I could have. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. I love, yeah, I love this so much. So I, I went <laughs> to a very small Catholic school. I was actually the last graduating class before it closed, um, which is oh, wow. hilarious. And but like, I am the youngest of four kids, so it's one of those schools where, like, as the youngest of four, all of the teachers knew who I was. Like, they called me Little Sokol. Like, they didn't even call me Adam. They just like used yeah. Lil. And and um, but because of that, I got to. I was basically like in, indoctrinated. Is a hilarious word to talk about a Catholic <laughs> school, but Catholic I got like in, exactly. I got like indoctrinated into just like the the really awesome community of this school. And part of it was, despite being small, they had an incredible auditorium. And most years they had an amazing theater program because there's actually they had a lot of very talented theater people. So like when I was really, really little, I went and saw my sister's friends in like Godspell and Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Yeah. Or like I saw my brother and I think he did like Bye Bye Birdie. And then like when I got to <laughs> high school, when I got to high school, we did um, Cinderella. I got to put a Herald. So it was like a 17 year old. Nice. I got to wear, yeah, like canary yellow the tights. The Roger Canary in Cinderella? Yeah. Yeah. So like canary yellow tights. I got to do like the first solo and like, again, like <laughs> not a great singer, but I could do it enough. But like, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And then like since then, it's just been like watching theater and then being obsessed with it. So, oh, I know. Yeah. So what? Um, Anytime I see live theater, I cry just mm-hmm. because I'm just like everyone is so talented, and it's just embarrassing for everyone who's like around me. <laughs> uh-huh. It's just like from the first like overture, I'm just like tearing up already. I was like, "Are you okay? No, I'm not. I'm never okay." <laughs> yeah, it's like, did you hear that? It's an oboe. Oboes are so beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> so what are some of the the shows that you like find the most joy in, or that you enjoy the most? I, so the ones that I performed in, and like, I cannot stress enough that this was like a very small community theater. So like we did a lot of shows that were kind of like knockoff versions of Disney movies. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I don't remember what the name of the company was. I'm sure it's whatever was like the rights could be bought the cheapest, but Mm -hmm. um, we did, we did Sleeping Beauty and I was like the Maleficent esque character awesome. who had like a different name and stuff and that was super super fun and that was my first like I think I was I think it was a freshman in high school like eighth grade freshman somewhere around there but that was my first like leading role and I had a really great time with it um my actual like my last role that I did before we moved was I was Belle and Beauty and the Beast over the summer and that was the first time that we had done like like shelled out to get the actual like Broadway script. So it was like the real show. Uh So we were all very excited (laughs) that we were doing something with like an actual orchestra and not like canned music over Uh (laughs) the stereo. Um, So I loved performing in those, but as far as like ones that I've seen, I have like a list of shows that uh, it's like my list of shows that I make me very mad that I did not continue to pursue theater. (laughs) Mm -hmm. and it's like Heathers is number one (laughs) yeah Uh, the music is just incredible um Hades Town is another one um that we listen to in the car all the time because like my my husband never 
performed in musical theater, but he's always like enjoyed it, mm-hmm. which is great. Then I can listen to all the soundtracks in the car. Um, I was obsessed with Phantom of the Opera as every like 16 year old who came out and was even vaguely adjacent <laughs> yeah. to any musical theater program was when like the Gerard Butler movie came out. Um, I was never a great soprano, but God, did I try to sing along <laughs> to that particular soundtrack. Um, but I just, I love, I love all of it. And mm-hmm. just, yeah, the, the amount of people who like you can act and you can sing and you can dance. That just seems unfair, but like keep going so I can watch you. <laughs> yeah. I So I may have, I, there was a, a previous, uh, a previous, episode of the podcast it was a while back now but um Kaylin Bayeron came on and I, we were talking about Phantom of the Opera specifically yeah, yeah. she's she's phenomenal and um <laughs> I I can't remember if I told this on that episode so if I did listeners I'm sorry I'll be brief uh when I was like four <laughs> or five I think might have been a little bit older but my parents took all of my siblings and I to Toronto like we got to see Phantom of the Opera in Toronto with like the I think original cast I don't know it was a very big deal and yeah. I at the time did not understand the concept of musicals. And so like after the <laughs> second song, which again is like it the whole thing is songs, I leaned over to my mom yeah. and she like to this day my mom remembers this. She like I leaned over and I was like, when are they gonna stop singing? And this like she just in about two and a half hours. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like I didn't understand the concept of any of it. And like it's since come to be one of my favorite musicals. Like he's like any person of a certain age but that certain age can be like 28 to 50 I feel like they were like interacting yeah. with Phantom it's so um, funny to me like the way that depending on like what your first exposure to that show was like how you react uh-huh. to the stage version because I have like a similar story where for my 16th birthday I like, didn't want a big party or anything so my, my mom took me to New York and we saw Phantom of the Opera and it was just me and her for like two days it was super nice But my exposure to the show at that point had been the movie where it's like Gerard Butler being real sexy as the Phantom. And that's what I was expecting. (laughs) The stage show was not that. (laughs) The Phantom is like real creepy. There's like Mm -hmm. not any, they do not try to like make it hot at all. And I was like, I mean, okay, like I'll, I'll roll with this interpretation, but I have Mm -hmm. some critiques. (laughs) Yeah. I, I feel like there was this series, this, there's this time period over the last, like, I don't know, I think it was probably like 10, 15 years, but when like, so Phantom came out and like Gerard Butler, I will, I will give him his props. Like for a actor who is not a professional singer, like he's fine. Like he sings good yeah. enough. And yeah. And like and now I'm like, I like look back at my reaction. I'm like, Oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. But like, like he's, he's passable. It, it's good enough. And then there was, um, there was Chicago, which like, I feel like everybody in Chicago is actually a pretty good singer. Like the mute, the, the yeah, movie version. Great. But, yeah. and then there, um, I love Les Mis, both the movie and the musical. Yeah. I'm a big Les Mis movie apologist. I know that. Yeah. People have- <laughs> so, so here's yeah, the thing. Was- <laughs> my, I have a friend who is my college roommate. He and I, and I hope he's listening to this, he and I will, like, every once in a while, we'll leave each other, like, voicemails or messages in the Russell Crowe singing voice, because he just, like, Uh-oh. there's a song, Stars, where he's, like, it sounds okay. like his nose is bugged. He's, like, yes, I blame it. And, like, we will <laughs> still, to this day, leave each other messages in that voice. And it's just, like, but again, like you said, I... I love musical theater so much that I can get past it. I'm like, I'm just glad that they're doing one of the yeah. shows I love as a movie. And it's, exactly. Uh, I'm like, I'm just, I'm, ha- I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> so you mentioned, um, you mentioned Heather's and Haiti Sound. Are there some other shows that, um, you know, like you said, you kind of didn't get to do anything else past 16, but like, are there some other shows that have stuck with you throughout kind of like the tests of time? Like, again, I will always love, um, like my dad's side of our family is Jewish, so I will always live fiddler on the roof. Um, there's like yeah, a few specific shows for me that like I will just I'll just listen to the whole thing every once in a while. Like, are there shows like that for you that have just stuck with you? Yes. Um, I love the sound of music. Mm-hmm. And that was actually like one of my very first experiences with the musical was whenever I was really young. Like I think I was I was like six or seven. I first watched The Sound of Music. 
because my grandmother really loved it. And so she like set us down and was like, here, we're going to watch The Sound of Music for, you know, five hours. We're all just going to sit here and pay very close attention (laughs) with like the double VHS tape and everything. Um, And I never got to be in that show, but very soon after I moved, my old high school did it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my friends that I had done theater with for many years before I moved ended up being in the show. And like one of my very best friends was Maria and another one was like mother superior. Like they, it like, we were of that age where it was like, okay, it's, it's your time <laughs> to like be the lead roles. So I got to come back and watch them do it. And it was super fun. And I've just always real, like, I still watch that movie. It's like my sick day movie. Like if mm-hmm. I know I'm not going to accomplish anything else that day, it's like I could just sit down and watch this out of music. <laughs> so that one has stuck with me for a very long time. Yeah. So I have a confession. I'm sure I'm going to get emails about this. Up until this past <laughs> Christmas, I had never seen The Sound of Music. I knew oh, no. some of the music, but I had never seen yeah. it. And it was it was on, I'm very, I'm a very nostalgic person, especially in the holidays. And I love watching like yeah. Miracle on 34th Street and, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. But I just had never seen it. And so it was on one day on like ABC or whatever. And I was like, yeah. all right, I will watch this. And so I watched it and I, and I loved it. And I couldn't believe I had never watched it before. But I watched it with fresh eyes in the sense that like, there are, I feel like there are things in both movies and musicals that like, if you see them when you're younger, you don't think anything of them and it feels natural. But watching them as adult, the the puppet show, the like lonely go Oh, terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. <laughs> are you kidding me? I was like, yeah. <laughs> how are people okay with this? And so like, the same thing, like I think about when I saw Godspell as a kid, um, my sister knows okay. this, like, remembers the story. Her, one of her best friends played Jesus. And spoiler alert for Godspell and the Bible, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Jesus gets crucified. And, like, I, like, I remember, like, sobbing. But also, like, I was like, oh, it was just part of the thing. And now looking back, I'm like, that would have been traumatizing as hell. <laughs> much, like these, <laughs> yeah, much like these puppets. Like, I just remember watching it in real time. And I was like. So everyone over the past like 50 years has just been cool with these terrifying goat puppets. Like I'm not. These awful puppets. Yeah. We were willing to overlook it for young Christopher Plummer. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so are there. Are other, multitude of those. Yeah. Are there other examples of that? You mentioned going to uh, New York to see Phantom. And I, I'm really lucky here in Cleveland. And I know I've mentioned this a few times on the show, but uh, Cleveland has outside of New York, we have the largest theater district in the country which well, I did not know that. Yeah. So That's people, really cool. don't, people don't realize that. So we get <laughs> first run shows. So like when Hamilton finally yeah. left New York, I think it went to Chicago for like a year, but like then it came here and Hades town was just here. Beetlejuice. Um, so, I mean, I've seen like yeah. everything and there are definitely shows. But, yeah. Like awesome. Lame is being one. Yeah. Lame is is definitely the one that like anytime it's here, I, I will see it. Like, are there shows that you actively try to go see as often as possible beyond Phantom? I actually, Phantom, I think, is the only one that I've ever seen more than once. And mm-hmm. it wasn't necessarily because I was seeking it out. It's just because, like, it's what I had the opportunity yeah. to go see. Um, I recently saw Les Mis. Uh, I, I take that back. I've seen Les Mis more than once, too. But one production was, like, not really a community. Like, it was a professional theater, but it wasn't, like, a like Broadway caliber. Yeah, like a regional thing. type of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And it was really good. And so I've seen that one twice. Um, we haven't had the opportunity to go very often. Like we're very close. We're in Nashville. Um, mm-hmm. And so they often will have uh, like traveling shows come through. And we try to go whenever we have the opportunity, but we also have small children. So yeah. <laughs> we don't have the opportunity to live far away from all sets of parents. So we don't have the opportunity as often here recently. But our daughter is just now like getting to the age where I think she would be able to like sit through it if we took her to see like the Lion King or something mm-hmm. like a Disney property, she would probably be able to sit through. So we're going to yeah. try and do that. sometimes. <laughs> there is, um, there's a frozen musical. Yes. And yeah. she has expressed a uh, heavy interest. I bet she has. Musical, yes. I have um, less heavy interest, but I'm like, listen, if it'll get you into it, we'll go. And yeah. her school, um, like the com- the community theater around here is pretty good, and her school will like they go see the shows in like the fall that they do. Mm-hmm. So she's had 
exposure to it has already been like, I would like to do that. I'm like, all right, well, yeah. we're gonna go. That's that's like one of those things. One of those things about this the small high school that I went to that I'm really thankful. A like I still talk to a lot of people that I went to high school with, which is wild because I'm in my yeah. late 30s. Um, but because it was so small, like I was captain of like the baseball and football team. I was in student government, and like also I got to. Be roles. Yeah. And it's like, it's so like when I tell people that it makes it sound like I'm very impressive. I'm not, it was a tiny school. Like I was a good athlete and I <laughs> was willing to make a fool of myself so I could be in the theater program it was really all it was. Yeah. But like, because of that, it was cool because that, like when we were like when even in, as like incoming freshmen, if you had that like interest, you could, like you said, like you could go on and be, you know, maybe you'd be in the chorus as a freshman for uh, you know, gentlemen prefer blondes or something. And then you could like, yeah. within a year or two, you would have like an actual role that was, um, you know, engaging and you got to speak and things like that. And yeah, I, I will say yeah. it, it's, it's still had an effect on me. Like to this day, I, I, I obviously the musical theater aspect, but like the storytelling parts as well. So I'm curious for oh, yeah. you, like how has musical theater had an effect on your storytelling process? I find myself especially if I'm writing like a conversation I try really hard to like have the like uh motion beats in between a conversation I see it very clearly in my head and sometimes I will try and like act out the facial expression that I feel like someone would be making to like hearing this conversation so I feel like it's a very similar process to what I would do like whenever I was figuring out like learning my lines and how I was going to, you know, act these yeah. scenes. Um, I use a very similar process whenever I'm like blocking a scene with characters in a book. Um, and it's actually, it's weird actually how similar the two <laughs> uh, processes are. <laughs> yeah, no, I, honestly, I, I know what you mean. Cause thinking about your new book, the Fox Glove King, like I'm thinking about, there's like one of the first scenes in the movie it's basically like on the outside of a, um, like these two people have a conversation. It's like one of like the first things that happen. actually. It's like on the outside yeah. of almost like a stoop. And it does feel very like, I know what you mean. Like it does feel very like blocked in a way. Like it, now hearing you yeah. talk about this, I definitely know what you mean. And about how they like, the the way that they converge back and forth almost feels kind of lyrical. Like I, and I actually, it definitely. Like, there's like beats and yeah, it, it's weird how similar it feels to me like sitting down and trying to figure that out versus like going to a blocking rehearsal and figuring out how you're going to move around the stage. Cause it's essentially the same thing. Just you're writing it instead of performing it. Yeah. Do you, do you try to make your stories kind of, cause I think one of the things about, one of the things I love about musical theater, especially, and like even plays like there can't be really any, wasted or like throwaway scenes like it it always it's almost like a middle grade book in the sense of like it has to be moving the plot forward at all times because people are watching it there's no time to like yeah. it's not like a movie where like you could stand up and like go grab a glass of water or like and there are sometimes in books where you're like okay what is what is the point of this scene but like yeah. for you <laughs> do you think about like when you're in addition to like the blocking aspects and the conversation do you think of stories in that same way or am I just like totally projecting on do you like no I definitely do I try um I try not to have any filler like everything that and especially since like the books that I've published up to this point have all been part of a series um there are sometimes things that are in one book that don't have a payoff within that book mm -hmm. um so like, there'll be things I'm sure that like might feel like filler, but I promise it's not <laughs> It's yeah. like everything that I, I try to make sure that everything that I include is pointing towards something mm -hmm. um, and like uh, giving you a clue to round out either the world or the character or the plot um, and just make it so that whenever you arrive at like the big moments and the climaxes mm -hmm. that you can kind of trace your way back and see all the things that were leading you up to that point. Yeah. Um, which is very similar to like a play or a musical, just like, because what you were saying, like you don't, you'll have time to sit and just add stuff for the sake of adding stuff. <laughs> like it's all there to serve a purpose. Yeah. And it's actually, I'm glad you mentioned your previous books and, and we're going to get to the Fox Love King and just a minute here. <laughs> but like, I, um, 
I was joking. I told you one of the like your your publicist, Alan, who I've known for a very long time. She was the one like she kept sending me like you need to do this book, you need to do this book, and I <laughs> I don't know like there was something that like sparked in my brain. I was like, wait, I, Hannah Witt, and I know that name, and then I was like, oh my god, true for the wolf. Like so that was like my first. I was like, oh, I was like, book. Oh. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I'm like that's her. So um, I I want to ask because one of the things you, know, you mentioned like to thinking about musical theater and different shows even like uh, to, uh, an example like into the woods is somewhat yeah. adjacent ish in the sense that it's a yes. fairy tale <laughs> story so for you like what made you want to because i've talked to, to a lot of people who have done like fairy tale reimaginings retellings like these and i i always think they're incredible types of stories so for those first few books what made you want to pick like little red riding hood as sort of a, a jumping off point um, yeah so i knew but there's so much about that book that changed like from the original idea to what it eventually became. But yeah. it was always going to be something Little Red Riding Hood adjacent. And that was mostly because I was thinking of Little Red Riding Hood in, in its um, places like a morality tale. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those uh, very old fairy tales that you can very easily kind of trace what it's trying to teach you in its original form, which is a lot about... Um, like purity and sexuality and staying on the path, not straying from where you were told to go. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff, uh, people a lot smarter than me have done like studies on um, how the woods in general is like a transformative space in fairy tales, how the beast archetype is like, impurity and worldliness like coming after you know your sweet little innocent protagonist mm -hmm. and I knew that I wanted to take all of those elements and fuck with them yeah and make something that was about choice and bodily autonomy and um discovery of yourself within like romance and sexuality and things of that nature um kind of the the ingenue becoming the beast situation mm -hmm. um so it was it was mostly the themes of that fairy tale that made me want to play with it yeah and, and i will say for anyone who hasn't read those books for for the wolf and for the throne uh, <laughs> buckle the hell up and do not expect it to be fair <laughs> like don't expect like oh i know the story of the little red riding Hood. yeah like, just get ready like <laughs> i i just wanted to like i, I don't know i i love those books so much and then for the fox Thank love king so like oh, you're welcome uh for the fox love king like obviously it, it's a departure maybe i don't know but this that's not like pulled from other stories no, is it, or am I yeah, misreading? It's no it's it's its own thing mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was um very much by design I think every author kind of you, you always have that fear after you've done your first book your first series like what if this is the only thing I could do <laughs> so I wanted to like purposefully do everything different <laughs> yeah so like in the Wilderwood duology, they were very limited cast, very kind of self-contained settings. So for this one, I was like, okay, I'm going to make a big world. It's going to have a map. We're going to be in like a castle. There's going to be a bazillion people all over the place. And then I was like, what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> so it was um, certainly a learning experience to go mm -hmm. uh, kind of make that 180 and decide I was going to do something that felt completely different. but. I it's it's been good so far. Yeah. It's been good to see myself. Yeah, well, I mean, I I was fortunate enough. Like I told you, I I got a copy of it before it's come out. We're recording this in February. The book comes out in March, and when people hear this, the the book will be out. But um, it's oh. it's so good, and it's so like I love how <laughs> it, you're welcome. I love how it plays with with death and like kind of like commoditizing death and like this yeah. really intricate and creepy way. And you're right. I I do love that. It's very. Uh, it is very sprawling and it is very like you have built a whole world. So for you, how did that feel coming from, like you said, coming from a story that, well, not like contained within a fairy tale, there were things that you knew you needed to kind of have in place, like the woods and these different aspects. So yeah. taking that and then being like, oh, actually I have to, I'm going to build a whole universe. Like what was that experience like for you? Daunting. Very daunting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... Uh, it, it kind of was going back to 
the books that I read whenever I was younger because I read like Lord of the Rings, obviously, but like Wheel of Time and these gigantic series yeah. with gigantic worlds. And for a long time, I thought like that's what fantasy was, especially adult fantasy. And I mean, I think there's, you know, still people that think that, but, um, so once I, whenever I was writing Wolf and Throne particularly, um, I knew that I wasn't doing that and it all, and felt a little bit self-conscious about the fact that I wasn't doing that and about the fact that it was so kind of self-contained. Um, so I wanted to like, just give it a shot and see if I could do it. And I remember I had started the book, um, a while ago, actually, like it was the book that I was writing when Wolf sold. Mm -hmm. So I had written like the first half of it and then, you know, ended up putting it to the side because I had to work on Wolf. Um, and then ended up coming back to it and be like, I think that this is like the thing I want to pursue after this series is over. Uh, so I had had, like, I had like Auverine and Delaire and then I was like, and I know there's stuff outside of that. I'm going to have to address eventually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I sat down and I drew a map for the first time. Um, and I remember just being like, how, like staring at the blank piece of paper and be like, how does one do this? And just kind of like drew some swiggly stuff. Uh-huh. I was like, there's a country. <laughs> but that kind of is emblematic of how the entire process went, was really just stabbing in the dark and seeing what stuck. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I've actually, I've seen people like on TikTok do where they're like splash coffee off of a like paintbrush yeah. and then they'll yeah. just like draw circles and like, they're, I like I made a map. Some people like pour rice and do like that. I'm like, that's way smarter than what I did. <laughs> <laughs> draw some squiggly lines. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, like I said, I, I love like the, I, I love everything about the book, but I love that it has, like I said, <laughs> I, I feel like, I don't know. I, I seek out, I don't read a ton of fantasy anymore, but the ones that I do seek out, I want it to be something where it's like unique. And I do love like the, again, the idea of there being like commoditizing death and yeah. I, I love that part so much but like I I never want to give away too much so I will let you kind of like <laughs> pitch the book now that we've talked around it for like 20 minutes like sure. uh, for people who are <laughs> unfamiliar with the Fox of King what would be kind of your pitch for them about what the the actual story is so the Fox of King is about lore she is a poison runner in the city of Delaire uh Delaire has a dead goddess problem um so about 500 years ago there was something called the God's Fall where all of the gods died except for Apollyus, who is our main like god of life he's just disappeared and nobody really knows where he is but we know where Nixara, the god of death is and she is underneath the city in the catacombs and her body is leaking power uh they call it mortem and it's the power of death and you can only use it if you've had a near-death experience or if you're lore who was born able to use it a fact that she keeps very close to the chest um, but she is a poison runner, like I said, so because people will use poison to try and either get close enough to death to be able to use mortem, or you can also use it to extend your life because you kind of like balance your organs mm-hmm. <laughs> on in that that precipice of death and life. And like, it's not a nice life that you get in exchange, but it is longer than it would be otherwise. Um, so Lore is doing pretty okay for herself living under the radar because being able to use mortem unless you are one of the people who was appointed um as able to use it is illegal until she accidentally raises a horse from the dead as one does as one does who who among us has not accidentally raised a horse from the dead um and then she gets captured she gets brought before the king she fully expects to get sent to prison or to be executed but he's like hey actually i need your help there is, as you know, an empire on our border that is a breath away from invading. There are mysterious deaths happening all over the edges of the country. We need you to be able to raise a body and ask it what's, what's happening. We also need you to keep an eye on my son because I'm pretty sure he's a spy for the enemy. So Laura finds herself within the court of the Citadel with Gabe, who is a surly one-eyed monk that is also a duke. And they're trying to keep an eye on Bastion, who is a really cool, like, pansexual playboy prince who doesn't care about anything except actually he cares about everything very, very much. And chaos ensues. Uh, chaos ensues is the right way to end that. <laughs> I, I'm always so impressed by, like, this, the way that you've built out this story there, like you said, there's 
a sprawling kind of like inter kingdom potential like things going on there's you've built out literally hundreds of years of history there's a magic system there's a massive cast of characters i when tackling a project like this where did did the story originate with like an idea of the magic an idea of the character an idea of the setting like there's so much that could be an entry point for this so for you what was it i have a very specific entry point for it and it's a weird one um, so the idea for the story came about from me getting extremely angry at the rise of Skywalker. I, I will explain how this happened. Okay. So I remember after seeing it, I was explaining to my poor husband who like was not as into the sequel trilogy as I was, but like mm-hmm. he was along for the ride, you know? Yeah. So we go see it. I am just upset. And he's like, okay, like, talk, talk me through it. Like, what, what's your problems here? I was like, all right, we'll start with the basic was the Ray Palpatine thing. Mm-hmm. Spoiler for the Rise of Skywalker, I guess, if you haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't recommend it, but spoiler alert anyway. So I was like, okay, Ray Palpatine could have been a cool idea. Could have been something that worked. If you had built up to it throughout the course of the trilogy, which is really just like, the downfall of the sequel trilogy in general. That's a, that's a conversation. We could have had that conversation, actually. Yeah. That could have been something that we talked about. Other than musical mm-hmm. theater. It was just me and my lifelong beef with J.J. Abrams. <laughs> like, okay, so, Ray Palpatine. And I remember explaining it to him, and, like, my brain was going a million miles an hour, and I was like, you know, I think that this could have worked as the middle installment of a trilogy, but it doesn't work as the last one, because you've, like if you had done it as a middle installment and had Ray actually like turn and like give into her dark side and had that be a thing, then it could have worked. But it there's just too much packed into this last movie that didn't make enough sense because it wasn't established earlier. Mm-hmm. So it got me thinking about, okay, so if you took a Ray-like character who is a nobody, who is just doing whatever she can to survive, who actually turns out to be this heir to a dark, horrible power that people have been working against for centuries to like keep contained how would that look so that was the entry point into this trilogy (laughs) and everything else i just kind of uh stuck like tropes that i liked into it (laughs) like i was like i haven't done like a court intrigue book yet that might be fun and i haven't done a love triangle like that would be fun to stick Mm -hmm. in there too so I'm extremely self-indulgent and it's just anything that seems shiny, like I'm going to try and stick in there. Uh-huh. Well, and it, I mean, I will say again, having read it, it all works. It all fits together. <laughs> it, is, it, it all works. I, that, that makes, I love that asking people what they're like, just much like how I love asking people what they're passionate about is so much fun for me. Asking people what their entry point to a story is, is great because it's yeah. never what I expect. No, it's always, it's, generally something which is wild <laughs> yeah oh, that's so fantastic um okay so i always end each show by asking the author who is on for a recommendation of some kind it can be a book um it can be i've had somebody my first guest recommended a protein powder because she talked about powerlifting. <laughs> i had somebody <laughs> recommend just going for a walk i had people recommend like specific tv shows anything that's you want to recommend <laughs> yeah Anything you want to recommend, again, it can be a book, but any recommendation you would like to give. Okay, I am going to recommend a podcast. Yes. Um, it is called Mabel. Mm-hmm. And I do not recall like what network it is with or the name of the creator. Cause, uh, wow, I am woefully <laughs> uh, ill-equipped. But if you search like podcast Mabel, it should come up. And it is an audio drama that is about, it's like horror fairies. Mm. which is something I feel like should be explored more. (laughs) And um, it's sapphic and the prose is really, really beautiful. I think there's like three seasons out right now, but I love it and I listen to it over and over again. So highly recommend. It's very, very good. I am literally, is it it by Becca De La Rosa and Mabel Martin? Yes. Okay. It is so creepy. (laughs) I have rarely so quickly looked up something that a guest has recommended. Oh my, it yes. says a podcast about ghosts, family secrets, strange houses, and misconnections. Oh my God. Yep. It's like, so the premise is like, um, this girl is a home health nurse 
And she is, she's a live-in home health nurse with this elderly woman that lives in this huge sprawling manor. And she is talking about her granddaughter named Mabel and like how she wants to reconnect. And so she starts leaving, like it's told through a series of voice memos, essentially, where she keeps calling Mabel and like leaving messages like, hey, your grandmother gave me this number. She's not doing well. She would really like to speak to you, but she can never actually get a hold of Mabel and things just start getting weirder and weirder and weirder. And as she discovers like something is not correct here. It's so awesome. good. I am on board. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> oh, Hannah, your new book, The Fox of King is so, so freaking good. I This was so much fun. Thank you for joining me today. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. Hi, my name is Sara, and I want to tell you about my podcast called Can I Offer You Some Feedback? I'm a business consultant and executive coach with over 20 years experience in change management, leadership development, and naturally providing feedback to high performers. My podcast is for those of you who have a complicated relationship with feedback, whether giving, receiving, avoiding, or seeking. Feedback is essential for our development. In each episode, you'll hear from real people across industries with their ideas, perspectives, and best practices on feedback. I'll also be sharing business bites with you, simple explanations of organizational tools, management techniques, and leadership philosophies that will help you and your businesses thrive. You can listen to Can I Offer You Some Feedback on your favorite podcast app or learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com.